Hello, my name is Ann Coiner. I work here at the Charlottesville Walter School and we wanna welcome all of you to our virtual first grade open house. Um, we're going to begin with a short presentation. I'm gonna share my screen with everyone and we'll move through that and then I'll introduce our faculty and school director and then we'll have um, several question and answer um, bits and feel free if you'd like to type in a question into our chat we'll also try to manage that and roll those into the questions that we're going to answer as well so i think i'll start by sharing my screen oops okay all right so hopefully everyone can see this this is a a lookbook we prepared um, specifically about first grade. So uh, here we look at first grade as the bridge into academics. Easing into academics through a readiness-centered early childhood program. In our play-based early childhood program, students learn to control their body movements through free play circle activities and fine motor tasks like painting, beeswax modeling, and kneading bread. Additionally, they learn how to navigate their days in a social group, learning to share, to follow instructions, and to have words for their needs and their feelings. The first grade marks a new stage of development wherein children can begin to shift their focus from developing their physical bodies and becoming part of a group to the new challenge of academic learning. When children enter the first grade, they know that it is a big deal. And so we do our best to show them that we understand that. We ask them to stand up straight and tall so that we can almost see those crowns on their heads. We ask them to sit at desks for part of the day rather than sitting on the floor. And we continue to give them meaningful work, although the work has changed to meet their, first, to meet their grade school first grade selves. Whole to parts. Rudolf Steiner, the founder of Waldorf Education, insisted that all teaching be intimately connected with life. This means that teachers are to begin with a whole experiential concept and that children can, that children can grasp, and they then proceed into more abstract concepts as the student's understanding expands. So how does this work in practice in school? To teach number sense, we start with items collected by the children that physically represent a particular number. For example, we ask the children on the playground to bring us something that is three. They cannot wait to spread out and search, and we then collect piles of three pointed leaves, sticks with three branches, and three leafed clovers. We approach each number from one to 12 in this way, and when we get to 12, we start to look at its parts. Starting with 12, how many ways can I describe what the number 12 is? We can say 12 equals 10 plus 2, 12 equals 6 plus 6, 12 equals three piles of four each, and 12 can equal two piles of six each, and so forth. In this way, we learn all four of the basic operations of arithmetic, addition, subtraction, multiplication and division at the same time, always starting with the large and whole number of 12. Each algorithm becomes a discovery and the students marvel at how big one number can be. To lay the foundation of reading in first grade, letters are brought through storytelling and artistic renditions of objects that resemble the letter. The fairy tale of the golden goose then becomes an introduction to the letter G through an emphasized use of the G sound, a drawing of a goose in the form of a G, and other multimedia opportunities to recreate the shape and sound. We find that when children learn with the assistance of stories, their learning is solid and rich. Storytelling and fairy tales. Much of the learning in the Waldorf grade school comes through stories. 
in the earlier grades until about halfway through fifth grade. These stories are gathered from the literature of world cultures. Then the stories become history. That particular literature and history will vary depending on where each Waldorf school is located. At our school, we start with ancient Greece in fifth grade, but by the end of the eighth grade, we are studying the, studying the history of the 21st century. In first grade, the story material is that of fairy tales. Each teacher is free to choose the story he or she feels would be appropriate for the children in their class. But regardless of the particular story, it will include elements that will speak to the developmental challenges of children in first grade. Something happens that makes it necessary for the child to leave the comforts of the known world and venture outside the home. The child meets challenges which sometimes seem insurmountable, but often the child has a helper, be it a kind animal or a wise angel, who helps the child overcome these challenges. By the end of the story, the child has reached safety and lives happily ever after. Each story therefore reassures the child that no matter how hard today might be, these confusions will be resolved and there are always adults and friends who will help. Specialty subjects. Our first graders begin their journey into academics with much more than reading and arithmetic. Their class schedule includes the following specialty subjects, many taught by a specialized teacher instead of their class teacher. Handwork. First graders learn to knit after sanding their knitting needles smooth. Spanish. Foreign language is taught by immersion with songs, stories, festivals, and artwork. Music. First grade music consists of the pentatonic flute and singing. Nature study. Quiet time in nature paired with nature stories nurture children's power of observation and curiosity, the basic building blocks of scientific discovery. And movement. Physical education in Waldorf schools takes the form of cooperative games and activities that develop children's balance, proprioception, physical strength, and teamwork capacities. That brings us to the end of our shared screen. So we're gonna go back to seeing each other. And now I would like to introduce our faculty and school director that have joined us here for our presentation today. We have Claudia Reinhardt, who is our current first grade teacher here at Charlottesville Waldorf School. We have Vivian Jones Schmidt, who will be our first grade teacher next year here at the school. And we have Amanda Tipton, who is our school director. And they are gonna all three be answering questions um, as we go through the rest of our uh, presentation today. So my first question is for Claudia. And that is, you know, we've just heard the hallmarks of a Walder first grade education, but what does a typical day look like for my child um, here in first grade? And just remember to unmute yourselves, guys. I think I just did. Um, so on a typical day, I would greet the students at the door with a handshake and kind of briefly check in um, how their morning has been. Um, and they would then in the, come into the classroom and enjoy a few moments of social time with their classmates um, until we had a little song. And once um, the students heard that, they kind of knew that it was time to come to their desks and to start the day. We'll start the day with like an overview of what's ahead um, in terms of specialty classes and special projects and things like that. And then we'll start our day with morning verse. And Overall, with some rhythmic activity, um, jump roping was very popular and very good way to start the day. In fact, in my specific class, um, the, we, we kind of had a cycle going where everyone would have a turn and then um, they, eventually the students wanted me to add up all their jumps. And um, um, so every day they wanted to beat the record and um, just um, before, um, the current interruptions to our regular school year, 
Um, we were at 862 jumps and that involved 10 students. So that was just very fabulous. It was just very exciting. Um, and just other rhythmic activities like the balance beam and things like that, that helped them um, be in um, their bodies. Um, we, during this time also, um, the students learn how to play the flute. And they are just some verses and poetry that we start learning by heart. Um, yes. So, um, and then after this rhythmic part, there'll come a time when we kind of settle down for our morning lesson. Um, so in our water school, we teach in blocks. And in the first grade, that rotation basically is between um, an arithmetic block and um, a language arts block. So where the content in the morning is kind of an immersion into that subject. And then after that, we let it rest a little bit. It doesn't mean that we don't do any math or any language arts when we're not in that block, but there's certainly a gesture toward letting that rest. And so um, we would start with a review of the lesson from the previous day. So for instance, um, you know, Anne was talking about the story of the golden goose. So um, for instance, um, if I would have told the story of the golden goose on the day prior, then I would review that story with the students and then out of that work for their new content, I would give them this picture of the goose and the letter G um, and that would be the lesson and there would be a book entry that they do because we don't really use textbooks but the students create their own work. And so at that point I would help them um, with the book work that they're engaged in at their desks. Um, then we would have an ending to our morning lesson in form of a verse. And after that, it would be snack and recess time. And um, in our class, that's a very kind of a community and social time. Um, and then we would go outside on the playground for recess um, for half an hour, 40 minutes. Um, and then once they come back in, um, the remainder of the day will be the time when they have specialty classes. Um, and as Anne mentioned in the first grade, that would be handwork, movement, and Spanish. So those would be subjects that they are immersed in during that time, but also um, skills lessons in language arts and arithmetic. Um, and um, toward the end of the day also, because it is just a, um, it's kind of a very big transition from early childhood to first grade. It's a much longer day. So we generally had a rest period. And um, I can't claim that any of my first graders ever wanted to sleep. Um, but um, it was certainly a downtime with story and just um, sort of a quiet time um, at the, toward the end of the day. Um, and then we um, would all have a verse together before dismissal. So that's kind of how the day would look in the first grade. Thank you, Claudia. I, I just had a quick question. When you do your blocks of reading and arithmetic, how long, how long do those last when the child's immersed in those subjects in the morning? I would say it's about three to four weeks. Okay. Okay, neat. Thank you. Um, so our next question is about academics, and this will be for Amanda Tipton. Um, what is the methodology for delivering academics in a Waldorf school? Well, that's a big question. Um, so um, I think that the one of the real hallmarks of, of Waldorf education, and we touched on it in the presentation, is that we always try to start with an experience or something that's real first. So that is, um, I think it's hard for us as adults to grasp that because we've, been, we've become so accustomed to abstractions. Um, you know, having the number four represent the numeric value of four is actually a pretty advanced um, concept. And we've just gotten accustomed to that being the case. So if we can really start with their daily experiences and make them meaningful through these exercises and this methodology of, you know, taking four of an object for apples, for example, and helping them understand the numeric value of four, that can really belong to the child. Um, 
because that that concept can be um, better internalized. They're also entering a kind of new realm of uh, awareness or consciousness in the world where their emotions um, are really starting to grow. If you've spent some time with a seven-year-old, you can see how, how the emotions start to um, change and, and evolve. And one of the um, amazing things about learning is that if you attach an emotion to it, it sticks. And the best way to do that is through storytelling. Um, we, we get interested and we get pulled into a story and we, we care about what happens at the end of it if it's told in the, in the way of a story. And so our teachers, our master storytellers, um, I always tell the story of my son who was in the first grade here. Um, and he woke up sick. He woke up with a fever and I told him that he couldn't go to school and he started crying. <laughs> it's like, that never happened to me when I was in school. I was always glad to get a sick day. And what he told me was that they were finishing the story that day and he couldn't bear to miss the end of the story. So um, the stories themselves are the material. And so you can bring any kind of academic uh, content through a story. And that's what our teachers are really masters at. And as they get older, those stories become more intricate and last over longer periods of time. Um, and that's really the, the hallmark and the difference of how our teachers um, approach teaching. So it's the same for math as it is for language arts, as it would be as they, as they move through the grades and they're studying botany or um, zoology. Um, it's always brought through that imagery. Um, and that is the one thing that I didn't touch on is that, um, you know, in the early childhood, we are really working on their imagination. We, we want them to have this open play, um, letting them create their play that isn't dictated by a media figure or, um, or somebody leading their play, like a teacher leading the play, it has to be born from them because what we're trying to do is give them the capacity to build their own mental images. Because when a child can do that, that's the basis of innovation. You know, you can't invent something out of, out of nothing if you don't have the first imaginative thought or the innovation to think of something new. And that is one of the basic tenets of Waldorf education is that the imagination is the basis for intellect. And so first grade is this really neat bridge between that of, of just this open imaginative play to bringing it into something that's more intellectual um, through, through the introduction of academics. I think I'm gonna stop because I could keep going on and on. <laughs> That's wonderful. We're going to get some concrete examples of that, I think, right now. Um, so I'm going to ask Claudia next. Um, so what does this look like or how does this work with math, for example, um, the storytelling? Yeah, so um, I guess as an example, I could share that. Um, so for, for instance, with my class now, um, I moved back to Virginia after some years in Vermont and where I lived which is what I shared with my students as an introduction. Where I lived, there was um, a gigantic oak tree. And in that oak tree, there lived two squirrels, and this is actually really true. And they were the fattest squirrels that you would have ever seen because they were children who left little treats for them. And my neighbor had just a gorgeous garden. And so um, I named one of those squirrels Nutkin and the other one Nutmeg. And these two squirrels had many adventures together where they would go out and they would collect acorns. Um, and so on one morning, maybe one would collect three and one would collect four and they would put them in the store and so forth. And as we kind of went on with this, what also happened is that every time they had 10, they would put them in a bag, which was kind of planting a seed for borrowing and carrying um, later. But, um, Anyhow, um, so this was kind of the story. And then um, in, that, in that tree though, there also lived a squirrel and the squirrel had the name Nip Nap. And as the name already implies, the squirrel was not really all that industrious, but he pretty much just liked to lay around 
And um, when the others, after a hard days of work, were sleeping, um, Nip Nap would come and like steal things away. And so this whole idea of subtraction is like when they heard Nip Nap, um, even though, you know, like once in a while he acted out of character and didn't take something or and actually made a contribution, but generally he acted in character and um, he would come and like take something away. So they really started to associate that with um, subtraction. Um, and then, um, so, so this is kind of sort of the mathematical part um, of um, our day, just like um, having this like story experience um, and really being able to live into these two characters. Um, and um, in the slideshow earlier, it was also mentioned like the importance of number quality. And that really has to do with like understanding, um, you know, what is three really? And how do I find a relationship to three or where do I find that pattern? Um, I think on the slideshow you saw, um, for instance, the number six was the, the bee because the beehive, um, you know, the cells are formed in shape of a hexagon and um, things like that. So that's kind of how um, math is brought to the student in a very imaginative way. Thank you. That's such a great example. Um, so I have a question now for Vivian. How does this work with reading? Um, you know, the bringing of the teaching of reading with story. So as as Claudia and Amanda and, um, and Anne actually have have referred to it, we, for we start with the story and the story of the golden goose is fine. We look for stories that not only have this um, developmental um, uh, that, that meet this developmental need of children of this age, but also ones that we can, we can use um, in this imaginative way. So we might do the golden goose for the G. Um, there are stories that have bears in them for a B. There's, um, you can see the, the chalkboard drawing behind Claudia is the fisherman and his wife. So you can have the, the fish for the F. So you can tell already that it's, it's a phonics-based reading system, but the approach is very different. It's not just um, this is an F and this is, this is the sound F makes, which frankly drives me a bit crazy. So <laughs> when, I, when we do the, the, when I draw the F, when I tell the story, and then the next day we draw a picture from the story and embedded in that picture will be the fish. And then the following day, we show that fish and we show where the F is. And um, then, uh, then we'll talk about it. And what I'll say is when, you know, do, boys and girls, when we see this letter, this sign here, we make the sound, can anybody think of a word that has that sound in it or that starts with that sound? And so the words themselves come from the children. And um, I probably would start, would tell the story and then I would write a sentence using that word, using the word fish. So the story is, the sentence is coming from the story and we will read the sentence and then we'll pull that word out and then we'll pull the letter out. And so we go from this broad imagination down to the letter itself. Um, generally, uh, we, we do, don't necessarily go through this process for every letter of the alphabet, but we go through it enough so that the children have this sense that every letter is connected to a meaning and a sound. And so they begin to look for the sounds of the particular letters. Um, and really by, generally by uh, December or January, um, they are reading simple sentences, they are seeing simple words. And then um, after Christmas or later in the spring, we go into word families and it becomes this very organic process. Um, so I think I'm going to stop there so we can keep going. Okay, thank you, Vivian. Um, I see we've had a question 
come into our queue. We're going to um, continue on because your question will come up a little later. So whoever asked that, we will cover your question in just a little bit. Um, so our, our next topic that we wanted to touch on, I'm going to ask Claudia to speak a little bit about the other kinds of subjects. I know I mentioned it in the presentation, but the other subjects um, that the children really focus on in first grade aside from arithmetic and reading. So in the first grade, um, the, the three subjects that we offer here at school, the three specialty subjects are um, handwork, movement, and Spanish. Um, in handwork, in the first grade, the students make their own knitting needles and then they learn how to knit. Um, and um, there's a picture somewhere on our school's website of like the day when my students all had, when, when every student had finished their flute case and they just had the huge smile. So it's, a lot of it has to do with like, um, you know, perseverance and finishing a project. Um, and it also has to do with, um, with dexterity, um, with, um, hand-eye coordination, just all those um, types of things that are so important for children. So that's in first, first grade handwork. And um, they, have, they have three handwork classes per week, and each of those classes is 40 minutes. Um, and then um, another specialty subject that we offer is movement, that um, in movement there's a lot of focus on just body awareness and um, um, cooperative games, how um, to play with each other, um, that kind of thing. It's not really competitive. Um, and that's, that happens twice a week. Um, and then they have two periods of Spanish. That is kind of like a full language immersion. Um, Senor de Georges, when he comes in, he starts to speak Spanish and he never stops. So um, it's, um, th that's the Spanish experience that the first graders have. And then later in the grades, there are other um, specialty classes that are offered, um, like strings um, and woodworking. Um, I've been a first grade teacher too long, I don't remember them all. Maybe somebody can help me out. Um, strings, strings, the woodworking. Um, um, eventually, algebra is taught um, in the middle school math and algebra taught by a specialty teacher um, rather than the class teacher. Yes. Thank you, Claudia. Um, <clears throat> the next question I wanted to cover, this is for Vivian. And a lot of us wonder about is there homework in first grade? And if there is, how, how much time does that take for my child each day? So the answer is they're tired by the end of the day. This, um, it, it, you know, to us as adults, it might not sound like it requires very much of a child, but to live into your imagination, to focus on things with the intensity of focus that um, this curriculum brings out of children, and the, also the, the very conscious structuring of the day. So going from the, the, the focus inside the classroom to outdoor play back to a specialty, or two specialties, then more outdoor play, and then back inside the classroom is very demanding. Um, and we recognize that in children. Um, I often, you know, I, I have parents um, of first graders who say to me, well, as soon as she gets in the car, she falls apart. <laughs> and so I suggest, well, bring a snack. That's number one, make sure they're fed and then give them downtime. So we don't give homework um, ordinarily in the first grade. If the children are very enthusiastic about something that we're talking about or learning in class, then I might say, well, what about if you bring me something tomorrow that is four, or bring me something tomorrow that is seven or two, or so forth. And, but it's something that comes out of the enthusiasm and interest of the children themselves. It's something that would be pretty easy for them to do, and it's not very taxing. We also think, um, feel that, that in the first grade, and even, even later, but especially in the first grade, they really need family time when they, leave, um, this, when they leave school. They need to spend time with their 
siblings, with their parents, with, at home, in their own backyards, being outside, you know, it's, it's just, that's very important to us. So we generally do not assign homework in the first grade. Thank you, Vivian, that's good news. <laughs> um, I, Vivian touched on this just now, but I wanted to ask Amanda if you could speak a little bit about the amount of time spent out, outdoors um, by our first graders or even just in general in Waldorf schools, the importance of outdoor time. Well, the, the best thing is that we're blessed with a beautiful campus with lots of green space outside. Um, our children have multiple um, areas to play on and we actually have access to a forested area and a creek in the back of our property that um, children can take nature walks and um, splash around in the creek and um, just a real gift that our school has that um, ability to offer. But our children, you know, all the way up to eighth grade um, spend time outside daily. And um, so they get, and one of the things we haven't really touched on is the length of the main lesson in the mornings. So they start out their mornings um, with that main lesson that comes in those four to six week blocks. And they get to school around eight in the morning and they're in that main lesson until 10. So it's just real, um, you know, they can really dig in and um, get into the subject matter in those first two hours. And that is a real inhale of information. And then we give them the exhale of, of the snack recess and they get to go outside. They get to have a snack, um, fill their tank again <laughs> for the rest of the day. And um, they come back for their first period. And then they have a lunch recess as well. And then on the days that they have movement, they are, those are typically always held outside unless there's really bad weather. And the thing to remember too is that we send the kids out in all weather. Um, you know, if it's raining outside, um, they still go outside. You know, the only time that we wouldn't send them is if there was some sort of, you know, a thunderstorm or something that just wasn't safe high wind advisories we get a lot around here. In this little corridor, there's, there's often high winds, so we have to keep an eye on that, but most of the time they, they play. And them being able to, to experience the weather is really good for, for their sensorial development too. It's something that in our, in our lives we're pretty separated from, so it's really important that they get that, and it's great. I remember being a parent, a very, you know, living in an urban area, and feeling like my children weren't getting enough outdoor time. And at least when I picked them up at the end of the Waldorf day, I knew they had gotten a good amount of time out in nature. Um, so I think that that's a real gift. And the fact that this particular school, Charlottesville Waldorf School has, at this point, I think we've got about 13 acres. Um, it's really fantastic that they get that um, outdoor time. Thank you, Amanda. It's all about the clothing, right? <laughs> Not about the weather, it's all about what you're wearing in the weather. Um, and, and so along with that, it sounds to me, you know, for a first grader, this is a vigorous day. This is a day with multiple times outside for lengthy periods of time, all this um, various kinds of learning. And Vivian's talking about them being so tired at the end of the day. Can you talk just a little bit more about the rest of time yeah. in the day? Right, so, you know, that the, the point of, picking them up and they're tired, um, at the end of the day, they have done a lot for, you know, seven-year-olds. So um, they get a rest period. I think um, Claudia mentioned that. Um, it depends on, the, a lot of classes have their own temperament. Um, I've seen first graders who were very um, phlegmatic, kind of like Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh, <laughs> and they would sleep. <laughs> And you would have to wake them up to be able to go home. I think Claudia's first grade was certainly not. They might have been more like Tigger um, and bouncing around a little by the end of the day. But at least giving them that time to wind down. As a parent, I really appreciated that they at least got that um, so that it wasn't a total meltdown in the car when you pick them up. Um, 
So, and it's really, uh, rest is the way that they figure out their day. I mean, if they get that time, that downtime to really kind of process everything that they've done that day, that's really important. I mean, we even offer that in the early childhood program because they need that, that downtime. We all do that in our sleep. Um, children need it a lot more because they're, everything is so brand new to them. So they have so much more to um, process. So um, yeah, rest is, is a built in part of their, their daily schedule in the first grade. And I bet my sixth grader wishes it was too. <laughs> and I think my eighth grader just took naps wherever apparently, cause that was actually in <laughs> his teacher's speech at the end of the year was about how often he took naps. So maybe he needed to rest at the end of the day too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Um, so our next question is for Vivian, and this is about challenging behaviors. So, you know, I'm curious, how do you handle challenging behaviors and social conflict or difficulty taking turns or difficulty following directions in the classroom and among your class um, in their various uh, activities during the day? Right. Um, well, I would say it's a multi-pronged approach. I mean, first of all, we don't expect children to come into the first grade fully socialized. Um, learning how to get along with other people is actually a lifelong journey. So we're just uh, laying the groundwork. Um, it's not to say that we anticipate having problems, but we're prepared. And um, so uh, if there's also, on, on the one hand, they don't know how to do these things. But on the other hand, they want to do what's right and they want adult approval. So you, you start from that kind, that assumption. This child wants to please important adults. And um, that just gives you, um, it gives you this insight and a, a tool that you can use for the child to, in working with a child. Um, they will... Uh, often they, they look to the adult as a model of how to work with other children. So I know in my own career um, of teaching, there have been times when I've noticed, probably not in first grade, but later on, I've noticed that, um, that children might be uh, ignoring one particular child or avoiding one particular child. And in my own self-reflection, that says to me, that I have somehow been avoiding or ignoring that child and I need to do work on my relationship with the child. And then I figure out how to do that and the whole situation turns around. And um, I certainly think that that applies for these young children as well, that as teachers, we have to look back through the day and figure out where these sort of hot points were and what led up to them and what happened after them. Um, which is one of the ways that we deal with um, situations that arise with children. If a child, um, if a child, if two children have a, a, a kind of a rough interaction and they need to take a break from one another, and then we have them maybe sit down for three minutes on the playground. When I call that child back to me at the end of that three minutes, the question I ask is what happened and what happened before that and what did you do? Because they will almost invariably say, you know, they'll point the finger. So-and-so did such and such. What did you do? What was your part in this? And then how are you going to handle that if it, if it comes up again? What can we think of some ideas of what you might do? Engaging the child in that way, doing using the tools of reflective listening and eye messages, but also um, kind of blending in these consequences because they need to know that, that their actions and their decisions do bring consequences. We all need that message in the world. Um, I think that um, that actually the amount of time we spend outside is uh, is another tool that we use because nature is very being in nature is very calming and balancing and um, being able to um, expand one's sensory um, knowledge and understanding is really important in this in the classroom often in the stories that we tell. Um, the fairy tales and the traditional literature, 
there are conflicts. And so we talk about how the characters resolve those conflicts. Children, again, they learn through story and through imagination. And we also expand their vocabularies in this way. Um, then we, um, you know, uh, Claudia talked about her two little squirrels and how she used the stories of her squirrels in arithmetic. I also had two little squirrels. <laughs> My squirrels were named uh, Chitter and Sprocket, and I don't know where in the world those names came from, but they were always having interpersonal conflicts. And so I would tell, when, when a, an issue would arise in the classroom, um, that I, I, would, I would address it directly, of course, because you have to, but I would also address it indirectly through the behaviors of these two little squirrels. Um, I've used raccoons, I've used skunks, I've, you know, I've pretty much gone the, the gamut of, uh, of wildlife and tried to, um, this is an interesting point, I think, tried to rely upon um, a characteristic of that particular animal, because this is, again, is part of the foundation of the science curriculum. All the time that they spend inside and the time that we spend with what we call these pedagogical or learning stories that the teacher basically creates out of her own imagination lays the foundation for what the children are later on going to learn um, in a more direct way uh, in their studies of the natural world. Thank you, Vivian. Um, our next question is for Amanda, and it's about technology. So can you explain Waldorf's low-tech approach to education? Sure. Um, so it kind of goes back again to the, the experiential introduction to concepts. Um, if we really want them to be able to own those concepts and remember them, they need to have a, a real life experience first and the virtual ones can come later. Um, that real engagement with the, the physical world, um, I think we're just seeing now how important it is to establish that before introducing, um, the introdu introducing technology. Because one of the things that have always stuck with me is a saying that says, if children don't know anything about the natural world, why would they protect it? And so we, we live in a, a time when you can spend the majority of your time inside and not have any connection at all to, to the natural world. And um, that I think is one of the big reasons that technology doesn't really have a place in um, educating a young child um, is, is basically that. They need to have real life experiences before they begin that. Um, the, the other things are kind of physical. I mean, you're thinking about the hours that children sit in front of a screen all day, um, how that affects their um, physical development, affects the eyes. You know, there's all kinds of things that it's not, it's not ideal for. And we're really wanting to remove stressors and barriers in, in learning environments instead of adding to them. <laughs> so that, that's a really important piece as well. Um, you know, even as the children um, get older, we encourage parents to limit screen time and to even there's been different campaigns in different Waldorf schools about waiting until a child is 14 to give them a cell phone and things of that nature. Um, because we still want them to be engaged in the world around them before they enter that endlessly entertaining uh, world of, of the cell phone and, and social media and all of that. Um, the eighth graders will begin with um, a technology block where they might um, d disassemble a computer and put it back together again or do a coding class and so they really understand technology as a tool and not a pastime and I think that that's a really important um, distinction to make in education. The other thing is that taking up instruction time to teach technology is in my opinion one of the biggest wastes of time because technology is designed so that anyone can pick it up and use it 
it's designed to be intuitive. And I think, I mean, when I was in school and they taught us computers, those computers do not exist anymore. <laughs> the floppy disk and the, you know, like that is not around and it's going to be exactly the same for our children. And so it is an incredible time suck out of their day to spend time teaching them about technology. We, um, <laughs> as they get into middle school, I think that there are some things that we are working on um, making sure they have typing skills and things like that so that then when they get into high school, it's not just going to be a, um, a, a culture shock to, to go from no technology to almost everything being through the computer. Um, we just had our own crash course in technology when we went to distance learning. And so I think this would be a good opportunity to talk a little bit about how, what our approach was during this time. Um, you know, the, I, the very idea of taking a Waldorf curriculum and trying to make it virtual was like an existential crisis <laughs> for many of us. Um, and it, uh, we were concerned and we, um, but we knew that we needed to provide something. And it took us about two weeks to um, switch to the Google Classroom platform and um, create our own guidelines um, based on the children's ages. And so we were able to create um, an approach that, you know, for let's say early childhood and up to grade three, um, they were the parents were receiving assignments through Google Classroom, um, and the children were basically as screen free as possible. The times that they did use the screen were for Zoom meetings with their teachers and with their classes, and that was considered more of a social time. And then anybody who tuned in a little early overheard talk about plays. So the children do plays every year, which we haven't really touched on yet. And it's always in the spring that we do our plays. And so that totally interrupted our um, spring, our, our spring play season. And we have had um, Vivian actually did her third grade play through Zoom. And uh, the sixth grade is working on their play through Zoom. Um, so those were some screen times, but we worked really hard to um, be very mindful about how much time the children were spending in front of the screen. So there was a good balance of receiving information through a virtual, in a virtual way, and then time for the child to explore and do that on their own. Um, my, my daughter is in the sixth grade and they did their geology block and their assignments were to go for walks and find the rocks that they were talking about and draw them and um, getting her outside was the hardest part, but when she was there, it was fine. Um, so we were really, as we're looking into next year, knowing that there's likely to be some interruptions um, throughout the school year, um, we'll be working over the summer to continue to improve. We've done two parent surveys to get feedback from our parents about what was working and what wasn't. Um, and certainly it's, it's a lot of work for parents and we understand that. And one of the things that we're working on moving forward is to, for children who, um, will be getting more instructional time through, um, through the Google classroom, that they all have a mentor, um, that a teacher will work with them. And that way that it's not all on the parent's shoulders, cause that is a really challenging for a parent. Um, but we, and that's in terms of our distance learning, but we are also um, in the final stages of, of a, a plan for next year of how we are going to be addressing COVID-19 and all of the different phases that we might be um, faced with. And so we already have a room use plan um, in the works for how we can separate classes out into two groups so that every class is um, at 10. And we are dividing out um, outdoor spaces so that people, classes are only gonna be using that to minimize exposure and things of that nature. So our goal right now is to have the details of that plan finalized by June 1st. And um, that will be in a form of a 
PowerPoint presentation. And if anyone would be interested in receiving that even before you've enrolled, I'd be happy to send that along once it's finalized. But again, it goes back to the fact that we do have such a large campus with lots of outdoor space. We are particularly well positioned to be able to continue um, as you know, to, to have the minimal amount of interruptions, depending on how the virus um, continues to progress or not. So. Thank yeah. you, Amanda. We, we've had two questions during the presentation and they're both kind of along the lines of what you were talking about, but I'll just, um, I'll just read the first question that had come through was how our um, approach or the curriculum might change in the coming year. And you spoke a little bit to that about needing to use distance learning at times when that's required. Um, I don't know if you want to speak more to that or not, but then the other question is also very similar. Um, it was just some of the processes or changes in the typical school day that we're considering with the reopening of school in the fall. So they're, they're kind of related questions, but if you wanted to expand at all on, um, on the fall. Well, it, so much of it has to do with where we are in August, and that's really difficult to predict at this point. Um, what we're trying to do is just taking all the different phases of opening and creating scenarios of how we, would, we will address it, assuming that there's a possibility for us to oscillate between different phases during, during the next school year so that we know what we're, what we're doing. And so, you know, the a whole idea of splitting classes out into smaller groups um, is if we were still in this phase one um, and we couldn't have groups of more than 10 people in a, in a room together. Um, you know, we're looking at altered schedules during those times because we don't, we have a limited amount of staff. And so to be able to make, to, to make sure that children are kind of traveling in a pod. That's kind of how I um, envision it. Um, you know, you don't want all of your special to specialty teachers um, working through in that day. So likely what we would do is have teaching partners so that each lead teacher, so your class teacher would be paired with a specialty teacher and that specialty teacher would teach in blocks. So none of this is finalized yet, but these are just some of the ideas that we are, we've been, um, brainstorming and, and talking to other schools about what they're doing because we're really fortunate to be part of a whole network of Waldorf schools through North America and there's been a great sharing of information between those schools and I'm also part of a cohort of um, heads of schools in the Charlottesville area and we've been meeting bi-weekly to share ideas and um, and concerns and and those sorts of things so we're really um, leveraging those connections to try to make the best um, decisions about reopening. It's such, a, it's such an uncertainty. Everyone has a lot of uncertainty right now and it's difficult to make plans when you're not sure what you're planning for. But I feel um, confident in, um, in this um, approach of creating the different scenarios. Thank you. And I think you did touch on how part of those scenarios could include uh, a dramatic increase in time outdoors because of it just being open air and, and less chance of getting sick um, when we're outside. Um, right. so. Yeah, I think, I mean, we have a lot of outdoor space and so, you know, being able to make use of that. But the truth is that we have actually enough classrooms even because of the, the size of our, so that there can be, um, you know, you can escape from the elements for, for your actual, the bulk of your class work. So um, it's a, it's almost like you have to have a multi-pronged approach of, of a mix of outdoor time and indoor instruction and, um, and lots of cleaning and uh, protocols that you follow if, if anyone gets sick and so every, I mean, it'll all be pretty um, mandated too by the CDC and um, the health department. And so we'll have to follow those guidelines as well. But as a private school, um, we're small, you know, we have smaller classes and that's, that's a good thing for us. And, um, you know, we're working on, you know, all 
off schedules and things to just try to keep people as separated and safe as as feasibly possible and keeping the well-being of the child in mind too because having a child sit all day and not be I don't even I don't understand how that would work so for us to be able to shift from indoor and outdoor um, scenarios is the only way that I can see anything like that working and and keep the child's well-being in the center of your decision making Thank you. We had another question, um, which was that Claudia mentioned her class playing the flute. Uh, do the first graders get to play or learn an instrument in class? Or could you speak a little bit more, Claudia, about um, the use of the flute in class? So in the first grade, the students learn um, to play a pentatonic flute. Um, the beauty in that instrument is actually that no matter which notes you play in which sequence, it always sounds beautiful because there is no dissonance. Um, and um, we pretty much play that every day. Um, and in the third grade, um, the students transition to a diatonic um, flute and, um, or a recorder. Um, Vivian might chime in on that, but anyways, I actually do have one in my desk, but um, anyway, so that's a diatonic instrument and later in the middle school often soprano, um, alto, tenor ones are all played and then of course later in the middle school, well actually in third grade, starting in third grade, the students also have the opportunity to play a stringed instrument. And I would also say that we use rhythm instruments a lot so that um, one thing that, that is often done is um, if the teacher doesn't have rhythm sticks, then, um, the, then she gets uh, links of dowels and the children sand them down and then she, then she will um, stain them and the children use them uh, for different uh, rhythmic effects and with, but with choral speaking and with singing. And of course we have drums, um, we have, um, let's see, uh, different kinds of shakers and, and other just rhythmic instruments. And uh, pentatonic is that those, those recorders have basically five notes, but the diatonic recorder has an entire scale. So that's the difference. Thank you, Vivian, for rounding that question out. Um, we had another question about, I had mentioned uh, Claudia teaching first grade this year, and then mentioned that Vivian was teaching it next year, and someone asked, is Claudia leaving your school? And so I thought maybe you guys could speak, um, or maybe Amanda could speak about uh, the, way that will, the way that works with first and second grade. Just so I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, starting next year is, is the Charlottesville Waldorf's first year of moving to mixed age learning. Um, and so what that means is that um, we will always have in any given year two self-standing classes plus that, and one of those is always the first grade. First grade is such an important bridge year that it is that they need to learn how to be grade school students. And so we wouldn't um, want to, put them in a combination right away. So um, next year will be the first year. And so what that means is that Vivian will be stepping in to be our standing first grade teacher. And that's how that will move forward. Um, Claudia is moving up with her current first grade um, now. And so she will be a standalone second grade. Um, from there, we will have a combined three, four, a combined five, six, and a combined seven, eight. And Claudia's class basically is waiting for the first grade. Um, so she would actually, if, if any of you have rising first graders now, they would have both Vivian and Claudia through their um, journey through the grades. So they would come in with Vivian in the first grade and then join the current second graders for a combined second, third grade class next year. Um, next year, we're planning on those two classes to have some specialties together, so they will get to form um, a bit as a class and get to know each other um, because they will be together until the eighth grade. Um, and what we have um, 
planned in that as well is that Claudia would be their teacher for the second, third, third, fourth, fourth, fifth. All right. And then at five, six, they will move into the middle school with a middle school teacher. And that middle school teacher will stay with them until they graduate through the eighth grade. So over the course of their time at the Walter School, they will have three teachers, their first grade teacher, their early grades teacher, and their middle school teacher. And this is the Bay School model that we've adopted, which is another Walter School who, um, who really saw the benefit of having mixed stage classes. And um, we're looking forward to this model for multiple reasons, um, but mo for the children, it is a much more healthy social environment to have larger classes. Um, we were seeing that our classes were ranging between eight and 11 students, and that can be challenging socially. Um, and we are looking to have um, classes that would be more between 18 and 20, 22, 24 students um, to have a much more um, robust um, social experience for the children. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I think that pretty much rounds out our presentation for today. We, um, we've answered all the questions that have come through on the chat and want to thank everyone so much for being here with us today. Uh, we are also looking forward, as Amanda just mentioned, our mixed age learning and our grades beyond first grade. We're looking forward to having a few more virtual open house tours and presentations. So you can stay tuned for that or we can put you on an email list for that. Um, you can also find out about those things by checking our website or um, following us on Facebook or Instagram, where we'll be announcing those things periodically. We're pulling those together. We're having a whole series this spring. So we're trying to pull the grade school, middle school, and a mixed age learning um, presentation together in the next month or so. And we've just completed an early childhood um, virtual open house presentation as well that's already linked to our website. So stay tuned for those. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, if you have more questions, feel free to contact us. You can contact me in the office, Amanda. We can put you in touch with our teachers as well. And we hope you have a wonderful day and um, we're all gonna make it through this. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, goodbye. Bye. Goodbye everyone.